Okay. Um, welcome to today, today's meeting of the Health and Social Care Select Committee of the London Borough of Hillingdon. This meeting is being broadcast from the Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon London. The purpose of this committee is to monitor services provided by our health partners and adult social care team and review their performance. We also undertake in-depth reviews and witness sessions on specific topics and submit our findings to the decision-making cabinet. My name is Councillor Nick Dennis and I am the chairman of this meet committee. Before we start, I'd like to make some important housekeeping points. Please can we ensure that our mobile phones are on silence. We're not expecting a fire drill, so if the fire alarm goes off, please follow Nikki out of the building, even if it's out of that window over there. Uh, as chairman, I'll call on those to speak during the meeting. Generally, I like to operate by first names, just because it's, I think, easier and nicer, so I'm ha happy to operate by first names if others are happy. Okay, so before we start, oh no, we are actually going to start, fantastic. Uh, Nikki, do we have any apologies for absence? Chairman, we've had apologies from Councillor Nelson West and Councillor Pringers here as his substitute. Welcome. Uh, any declarations of interest before this meeting? No, we're all good, fantastic. Um, do we agree the minutes of the meeting on the 22nd of June? Agreed, Agreed? fantastic. Right, okay, excellent. So that means we go on to our first agenda item, which is the Council's... Sorry. Oh, yes. Uh, everything that we're talking about tonight is, is going to be in part one in public. So that'll be good. Um, okay, so we move on to agenda item five, which is the council strategy for 2022 to 2026. Uh, and we have um, Tony Zayman, the interim chief executive here, and Dan Kennedy, executive director of central services. So, Tony, how would you like to present this? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm just going to give a just brief overview introduction and... Uh, and then Dan will sort of drill into a little bit more detail, but um, assume you've sort of seen it and open it up for sort of questions and discussion. So just in relation to the, the starting point, it's purposefully a strategy rather than a plan um, because it's something about uh, an ambition over the period of um, the next four years, so the administration, um, if you like. It um, has at its core um, some of the pledges that were sort of made during that, as you would expect to see, but it's rather more based on um, sort of outcomes in terms of um, the benefits for residents and what, and the aim of it being a strategy is that, um, so instead of every year we just list a range of things, not just, but we list a range of things that we say, okay, we've done this, we've done this, we've done the other. Actually, here is an ambition that's sort of longer term. Um, so, so reducing carbon would be a good example. Um, and then what we can say is as we aim towards that, we will then sit, have sitting behind it um, annual plans that do exist within services. So in Sandra's area, Jan's area sitting here, um, and others, they will have annual plans that contribute towards delivering the outcomes that are set out in here. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different approach to one that certainly in the time that I've been here that we've, um, that we've had. It's obviously got at the core of it as well the medium-term financial forecast. So the, you know, so it's not uh, it's not a pipe dream. It's built on what we understand um, the financial position of the authority it is, but it's also built on what we understand the ambitions of residents to be, and also about how we're wanting to operate as a council going forward. So what our commitment to um, residents is. So I think I'll just leave it at that sort of high level just to give you a context. And then Dan, if you just want to walk through the different stages of it. Thanks, Tony. <coughs> um, good evening, committee. So as Tony said, it's um, a high-level strategy document. Um, it will be complemented by um, an annual business plan which will set out actions and targets, as you can imagine. Um, so that, that level of detail doesn't appear in the document. But if I walk you through the sort of structure of the document, so we've got some ambitions, uh, two ambitions in there, as well as our vision. As an ambition, and this is an important difference, an ambition for residents, uh, which is very much about place, an ambition for us to contribute to that as, as a council. I think that's important just to just to kind of pause on that point, is that as a local authority, we also we have an important role ab about leadership of place, not just the organisation that we manage. And so um, the other important aspect in terms of structure is that we set out five commitments to our residents. And if we just pause on those for a moment, so safe and strong communities, thriving, healthy households, a green and sustainable borough, uh, just touching on the point Tony made about carbon reduction, a thriving economy, and a digital-enabled, modern, well-run council. 
And that, that effectively provides us with the framework for those, um, for those targets that then follow and are set every year. Um, the, other, the other sort of important um, point that I can just sort of go on to is around the consultation. So that commenced on the 8th of July. It runs until the 9th of September. Um, and we are being proactive in encouraging uh, residents, businesses, other organisations to uh, participate um, and have their say. So we're promoting it actively through social media, survey tool on our website. We're writing out to and have uh, actively contacted over 350 organisations and we will keep continuing to do that. And so, for example, our monthly... Um, um, con uh, update to all, uh, to all residents who have subscribed to such uh, included uh, some promotional information yesterday um, uh, encouraging residents to have their say. So in terms of next steps after consultation, we'll obviously give um, due consideration to the findings from the consultation um, and the final proposal will be presented to Cabinet in October and then full Council in November. Okay, so welcome any questions. Thank you. I've got two questions and I'll open up to colleagues. Um, my first sort of point uh, is that um, the bits that I think are most relevant to our committee sound very good, um, which are essentially the first few bullet points under number two, thriving healthy households, such as working with partners and developing innovative ways to achieve things, working with the MHS, better access to health care, all this sort of stuff. I think it all sounds very good. Um, so my first question really is about accountability and how that looks in terms of how that will be measured because in essence what's down here I think everyone would agree with as being brilliant ambitions but how is in a four year over a four year cycle is that going to work in terms of us being able to hold you to account on these bullet points Thank you so um, just to if I take a step back the other thing that is probably worth mentioning about it you'll see that it's set out and I'm unsure as to whether it might be this is where your question is coming from. Rather than previously where things would have been set out that this is what children's services will do, this is what adult services will do, this, et cetera, et cetera, um, this is about, it's, it's, it's thinking about outcomes as a matrix. So, um, and it does make it more difficult to be more sort of directly accountable, I accept. But, but that said, um, some of the indices that make those things up, let me think of a, a, a good example. Um, you know, so how we how we think about um, sort of family hubs or something like that, or or venues in in areas that provide a range of different services or something like that. It's not about what one service is doing. It's about how we as a council are sort of coming together and using our resources to deliver better outcomes in any one place. So, and it could be that um, if some aspects of what we're doing here in terms of like innovative programs that we sort of talked about. If there's an element of that which is about supporting somebody in relation to their housing, um, but they also happen to have a child that's looked after or they have a, an elderly uh, relative who is in receipt of telecare or something like that, those individual things will still be something that's measured as a part of the performance framework in this case in Sandra's area or in Julie Kelly's area or in children's services. Um, so those individual things will still be measured, still be open to scrutiny and sort of in select committees and everything else. But what we'll do is we'll bring them together as a single narrative that reflects the ambitions here. So the component parts, if you like, are still there. Um, and if you were wanting to ask a question um, about, you know, how we're supporting... Um, you know, older people's housing, for example, or something like that, then you could still ask that question, even though it may not be seen here as a distinct and discrete identified ambition. But it is a part of, I um, can't think of whichever, support, support, the, support the most vulnerable residents in our communities, for example. It's a part of that. Um, and what we would expect to see, and it might be something that the committee would like to look at later on, is some of the service plans that will reflect those individual things because I think the service plans are important because they're the granular detail that sits behind this because this has to be high level because we wanted it to go over time rather than it loses currency just after the first year or, or something which is why you won't see very specific service targets and things like that in here hope that answers the question. No, I mean, I, I, in general, I'm, I'm supportive of, of that approach because, um, 
in the past I have been frustrated by concentration on granular individual statistics, which I think, you know, you can ask a question of why are we 3% better this quarter compared to that quarter and 2% worse off than the national average, but 3% better than the northwest average. And it's like, okay, you can get an answer to that, but do you get a real picture of what's going on? But I think the, the challenge with this, this type of stuff is to make sure that there's a link that people understand between that high level and the example I gave of the statistics. And I think that's... Um, uh, you know, important. I assume when the annual report comes out, that might be a bit more clearer in terms of how that link happens. Um, the other sort of question I have is sort of a point, I suppose, uh, as much as a question. One of the things that really interests me is is the journey, as well as the sort of where we are at. And I think um, a lot of these things are aspirational, which is great. But to really understand how we're going to do over that four-year period, it's good to know where we're at now. So, will the annual report sort of give us a sort of stop take of where we're at now because obviously uh, are we you know are we more are we delivering in a more innovative way for residents now you know in four years time when i asked when i when if i'm still here sat in this position and asking that question you know i won't know until, unless i have know exactly where we are now and what that journey is so is, is is will the annual report or some other way make it clear where that is so we can track that journey so i think um <coughs> Just in terms of um, what lies beneath uh, the strategy, there are a number of component uh, parts supporting strategies as well. So if I, if I make reference to, say, the housing strategy, which, is, which will feed directly into one of these five commitments, there has been an assessment completed, particularly around, say, homelessness, one of our statutory responsibilities, um, and that will be in, a, in the form of a separate report that would have come to a committee at that point in time, which will set out our trajectory, our baseline and our trajectory. And then all of that will, over time, um, be um, possible to then group together or select key information and then report to committees. So it's entirely possible. Um, and I think just reassuring committee that actually a lot of the work is already underway in component parts, which, which sum to uh, something greater than the whole way. Sorry. And, um, and if I may, just to add, which is one of the reasons why we've tried to avoid saying more of or fewer than or be, because actually if this is it's a continuum of um, and if I you know usually explore innovatively well innovatively changes from what it is today about what we know of ways of delivering services in different ways to what it will be in two or three years time um, and that sounds like it could be a little bit of a get out but I think what you'll probably see as I say if you look at some of the service plans that'll that they're almost the baselines for things really. So, you know, we currently have, you know, X number of people in extra care housing and if in three years time, you know, if that strategy is continuing then we'd expect to see that, you know, at least being the same or, you know, increased. Or if there is a different way or a different approach that we have of supporting people in their own homes, there may be fewer. But there'll be an explanation as around it as to why why that's sort of happened and why that's sort of innovative. But again, I think that detail will come through more in service plans than at this high level strategy. Though um, though we do have an ambition and the, the, the leader of the council is very keen that we do have something that resembles like a balanced scorecard type approach that just shows that sort of progress and actually puts some definition behind what some of these words are because they, as I say, they are deliberately not committing to a very specific outcome but it is about continuous improvement, I think, would be the fairest way of putting it. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, Philip, or is it? Okay, yeah, June, June, okay. Yeah, I'll, okay, all right, okay, I'll go Philip. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman. Um, I, I, it's a good-looking document. Uh, it's a good, you know, as you'd expect, it's a high-level overview of that which we're looking to achieve in strategy terms over the four-year period. Um, very much look forward to seeing the business plan and what stemmed from that because clearly there will be a lot more meat on the bone because um, I can think of things I'd want to talk about here but clearly this is neither time nor the place. I guess the, the normal reporting cycle will give us an opportunity to get our teeth into that so uh, look forward to that. Uh, I want you to make an observation though. Uh, this, I'm conscious this may not be quite within our remit. I'm looking at um, the top of page 12 and the comments that um, apparently are for us to talk, these are the things for us to talk about. So uh, points numbers one to six. This is my Mark Braddock there. Uh, they're, they're, they're noted as the items. But one of the things that concerns me a little bit is the uh, uh, around the digitisation agenda. Because whilst that may not be 
within this committee's remit. A lawful lot of the people for whom this will be a challenge are people who are in receipt of services that do come under the purview of, of this uh, committee. So I guess, I mean, it comes back to your point, Tony, about it being cross-cutting. Uh, you know, so it's something I'm conscious of, because we do need to get it right, and wherever it sits committee-wide, I think that's something that we should all be conscious of. So I don't know where there's an answer to that, but I would like to make the point. Yeah. Um, Again, I suppose it sort of fits within the the, the, the notion that um, just because we're talking about a a kind of digital future, it's more of it's more of how services are supported than necessarily delivered. If that if that makes sense, um, but I, I think um, I'll, I'll take the opportunity because it, funnily enough, it came up at another select committee. Um, but I think there is a little caution around what digital means, and particularly in relation to those areas that are more about um, dealing with vulnerable residents um, or um, you know, older residents and so on. And, and, and I think there is a view that, that digital means stopping doing something um, you know, in its entirety. And I think the most common example that maybe Dan and I have encountered in these discussions is the one about, um, so somebody's not going to be able to phone up the council then or something. Well, well, actually, the, 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 you know, the digital point behind that is less about whether they'll be able to pick up a phone and dial a number, because I expect that they will. The difference might be that we have a whole range of artificial intelligence that sits behind that number um, that actually deals with a number of things that emerge um, that actually don't require it to go through to a human being. That said... If it needs to, it will. Um, and I think there is just something about as we move through that agenda, and it is a, you, you're absolutely right, Councillor Corbyn, it's a massive cross-cutting um, agenda for all of the services, and there's no, there's no select committee that we'll be going to that isn't going to be impacted by some of the digital changes that we're going to be making. But, but it means different things in different areas um, and in very different ways. And one of the things that we're quite keen to do, and Dan and I have spoken about this, is that when we are making transformational changes, which all will be done on the basis of enhancing what services are, so it's, n it's not about making them worse, it's about making them better, but in order to make things better, we need to be ensuring that we're communicating people that they can be good consumers of the services that, that we're creating. And, and I think it's often something that's a bit of an afterthought. Um, and given hopefully that we're mentioning it here, it's not now, and we're thinking about, okay, what do we need to put around this? And again, I'll give you a concrete example of where we're talking about how we're going to be working more on a locality basis and a neighborhood basis. Um, and again, Sandra will know this from a, another area of work where we're already thinking through, well, okay, we'll be going and talking to residents in those localities about the services that they're going to have access to to take their views on it. And that kind of engagement actually enables us to start talking positively about some of the changes that are coming along and hopefully alleviating some of the anxieties that, that people have. Because often anxieties are born from not quite understanding it, rather more than something being a good or bad idea. Um, it's, uh, yeah. So um, I'm not sure if that answers your question entirely, Councillor Cawthorn, but... Uh just, <coughs> just briefly, uh, Tony, I'm reassured by that. Um, I mean, we've worked together for long enough. Uh, in different guises, but uh, I'll j just go back to the assisted living technology major review last year. I mean, there's some huge opportunities there, but we've not got a journey to go on with some of the people involved in the nicest possible way. We've got to take them with us. So as long as we're doing that as part of this, then I'm, yeah, I'm fully behind it, and I welcome it. Thank you. I often think it's about being shown, isn't it? I mean, mm. just as a sort of colloquial, my personal example, my GP's moved to a lot more online stuff. Mm. I can't use their service. And I'm quite tech savvy. I just want someone to show me, or a video to show me. But anyway, that's another issue in my life, which I'll take outside this committee. Um, but, but quite often, I think that's part of it when you move it, isn't it? It's, you know, it's that barrier. Once you've been shown and you know how, then you can move on. But it's intimidating beforehand. Anyway, technology can we can talk about it all night. And June's got some questions. So just June just a quick question, following on from what you said, um, uh, Chairman, is that yes, all this technology it's there to be shown. There are still some of our residents who will not embrace that technology. And you're saying that there's behind the, behind the, behind the surface 
there will be different areas setting up. I'm talking about, you know, automated system to guide and direct and so forth. Some residents will not be able to grasp that. So what will be in place for that? Because even when they do make a phone call to the system, I say the call because it will be one centre system, they still want to hear a voice of a human. They don't want to hear an automated voice. So what provision will be in place for, to enable them to have that access? So uh, hopefully a couple of reassurances. Um, one is that in terms of, and one of the challenges that we get quite frequently from cabinet members and, and so on is about this exact point, um, that not everybody is going to immediately be able to do that. We're not making an assumption that um, it's just going to be a, a, a sort of a blanket, one day it's this way, the next day it's that way, um, in every part of the borough. We've got, and again, it might be something that may be useful if it fits within the scope of this, of this committee to hear at a later point. So we've got a lot of intelligence that's born from a number of different sources that tells us about um, how receptive different parts of the borough would be um, to operating in a more digital way. So for example, those that, and to use concrete examples that we're probably all familiar with, those that would be um, happy to do their banking on their phone, because actually we know who those people are already. We know through different sources of data and information that we have available to us um, who, how many people in this borough use online banking, for example. How many do it on a tablet, a phone? Or what? All of that information we've used to construct a view of the borough. Um, and then it's categorized into those that are going to be champions of digital, those that are going to be, um, I won't say blockers, but let's say um, hesitant um, in, in relation to the use of those sort of things. And what we'll do is tailor the approach according to the understanding that we have. So it won't be one day it's this, the next day it's that, for everybody in every part of this borough. I think the other part of, um, of it is that, the, uh, um, and again, and I think uh, when we get to this point, it might be useful to have it as a, you know, something to have a look at here, is when we move into the territory of having some of these things available and online to actually... Um, and it all sounds, forgive me, I don't mean to be patronising, you know, it, all do, it does all sound a little science fiction, um, but actually it's quite real. It happens, it's in every day, virtually a lot of the transactions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis now are, are AI-based, artificial intelligence-based, and, and they're self-learning machines as well. So they learn language, they use styles of phrases, styles of speech, and, and so on and so forth. So this, and, and it's iterative over time. So obviously you start by, it's, nothing is out of a box, so you, we create based on our understanding and we, and we use all of the recording that we have in the contact centre currently, so actual words that people use and phrases that people use to start building how that artificial intelligence is initially going to work. And then as it hears more phrases and so on and so forth, we continually keep improving it. And the voice and the voices, again, aren't necessarily like a robot sounding voice, you know, it's a human sounding voice. And, but there will always be, and this is entirely within our gift to decide, there will always be a point at which somebody can say, I want to speak to a human, obviously not those words, but, you know, um, if, they're, if they're not satisfied with what it is that they're picking up, um, we are absolutely ensuring that there is a, it will go over to an operative who can then say, oh, I understand there's a problem with blah, blah. But they will have already known what it is that has happened. And it's not press this, you know, press six for this, press five for that. It's actually speaking. Um, you know, so it's somebody saying, can you tell me what you're phoning about today? Oh, um, my bin wasn't collected this morning. And it will be that fluid a kind of conversation um, because it's all sort of built in there already because they're the most common calls that, that we get. Um, so I hope that offers you some reassurance, but I think for more reassurance, as I say, as we progress this a little further, it might be good for it to come here for you to be able to sort of see and hear it and have a demonstration of it, perhaps. I think that's a really great offer. I think we'd like to take up. June, do you have anything else? No. Okay, sit down. Hi. Um, well, I, I applaud and embrace visionary thinking because I think that that is the way that all organisations should approach um, progress. Um, one of the things that I do believe um, that we can't move away from is um, going back onto this digital um, movement is that we can, when something is transactional, AI is perfect. 
the minute something becomes a problem for even for me and I am a champion of technology in that sense of being able to do things quickly um, I want to speak to someone and I don't want to spend hours on a where do you want to go here and do you want to spend you know process of five ways before I can get to speak to somebody and the call centers of the previous thing moving from England to India and everything like that proved that that was not a good plan so I think that needs to be understood and built in I totally believe that these are all cross-cutting themes through all the select committees because this is about the visionary of a council rather than about a select committee um, and therefore it will be the same for health service of green sustainable boroughs for example of how our ho GP services hospital how we all become sustainable and green in the way that we approach stuff how we all have thriving healthy households um, one of the things that I do believe that um, we should really be kind of work towards as well is that we have um, strong plans in making sure that if this is like a four-year plan or a ten-year plan or whatever it is that they are real markers real markers of progress because if we don't have those real markers of progress then how do we know that any of these visions are working because visionary can be visionary today and it can be gone tomorrow mm -hmm. and it will change um, and society changes because society is fluid demographics are fluid so therefore we need to make sure that we are continuously adapting to our locality as you said and to the kind of um, information that is in you know in our communities across the borough You just want to agree. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, good. Yeah, no, good. Okay, so um, as, the, as there are no other questions, um, I, I think as a committee, could we agree that Nikki will write a little paragraph for us to go to the Cabinet based on our discussions, which essentially will probably say we welcome the ambition and aims, um, but we want to know more about the accountability and the measuring point that you made, Cecil, but also as well to mention that the tech point that Philip and June talked about is actually an important area for us because of the people involved under um, our remit. So if, if you're okay to write a paragraph based on that to circulate yep. to us so we can add it to the Cabinet report. Yep, problem. Great, good stuff. Okay, well, thank you very much. That item's finished, so Tony and Dan, you're free to leave if you wish. <laughs> good stuff, right. Excellent. So that means we move on to uh, agenda item six, which is the social care and public health update. And we have here tonight Sandra Taylor, who's Executive Director of Adult Services and Health at London Borough Hilton, and Jan Major, who's Head of Direct Care Provision. Well, I don't need glasses still, that's very good for me to know. But okay, so Sandra, how would you like to present your paper? Thank you, Chairman. Um, before I start, I just... Tony's left now, but I should have added it while, whilst he was here. just want to pick up on Council Cawthorn's point about... So I'm here to talk about adult social care, which, as Councillor Cawthorn will know, is pretty much my passion, really. So assistive technology is such a positive and effective way of managing people's support and care and promoting their independence, that whatever we can do within this council to assist that, and I absolutely get the point about the contact centre, but all of our residents using social care come to us through the contact centre so it's absolutely within our gift now to get that right to make sure that the people that they speak to and the systems that they speak to get them an assessment of their needs at the earliest point possible and that might just be that they want some telecare but telecare is just the kind of um, minuscule part of the assistive technology that supports individuals and for me we've got such a good opportunity through the council strategy to blend that into everything that we're doing so it isn't just about giving someone an Amazon Echo or a, a digital watch it's, it's much more about when they do contact us for an assessment that they get a good response early urgently and at a time because we have a 24-hour MASH service that answers calls to residents in need of social care and that needs to be really really good so this is a very good opportunity to make sure that we get that automation right 
and it means that residents will get a much more responsive service. And I really do take Councillor Nelson's point about not everyone is at the position, particularly our very vulnerable older people, to be using some of those services. But that's exactly why we need to get to more people more quickly with a better and more fluid um, contact centre service. So I'm, I'm in agreement and it, it very much is very cross-cutting for social care. So with that said, if it's okay, I shall move on. Um, I was asked to um, give you a brief overview. The directorate that I now manage is Adult Services and Health, which is a newly formed directorate um, as part of the new structure of, of the council. And so I've given an overview of all of the services that are within my remit. Now, I know that you've, you've obviously had a chance to read that, and there's quite a lot in there. So I'm assuming that you've had the opportunity to pick up on some of those things. And Councillor Dennis also asked me some additional questions um, about what's in the paper today. So I thought I'd make a start by going through some of those and then give everyone the opportunity to ask questions about the directorate, if that's OK. okay so, um, one of the things that you may well be aware of um, in social care is the changes to legislation that are about to happen. So at the end of this year, so October actually, um, there are some really significant legislation changes around the charging reforms for people using social care services. So it's particularly important time for us to understand all the services that we have how people are eligible for services and how we manage, manage social care budgets, but equally how we'll be charging residents in the future. Because after October 2023, people that currently self-fund their care, um, the legislation is changing and they will be able to come to the council for an assessment, which is why we need an automated front door, because the demand for those assessments will significantly grow and um, that would be a CARE Act assessment and they will be able to ask us to start their care cap um, clock ticking which is an account where they have a, an account which starts to count the amount that they're spending of their own finances on their care if they have above, above the thresholds and that means that the council will become liable once they reach um, a £56,500 um, for the cost of their care in the future. So that's, that really does mean that we as a service need to be ready and able to be able to have the market shaped. It affects the care providers who are currently providing, most of our providers provide a blended service to residents, which is council provides and pays for care partly funded by residents through a financial assessment or completely personal funds privately funded by residents. So it's a whole piece of work across the area that is really important that we, we pick up on and start to shape for the future. In addition to that really important legislation which is a, a, a real benefit to residents but significant work and challenge to um, social care is the fact that social care departments will be inspected for the first time um, again next, starting next year. So between April 23 and March 25, all local authority social services departments will be inspected by CQC. Now this used to happen, I've been around for quite a while and I've seen inspections in previous years, but hasn't happened for the last 12 to 15 years. It was stopped. So that is a, a re-inspection of safety, so things like safeguarding of um, quality and the outcomes from social work assessments. And the purpose of that is to rate the council's ability to be able to provide services that meet the needs of residents in their localities. So those are the really key important things that my teams will be looking at and delivering over the coming um, really it's it's two years but certainly things become very busy from next year we don't know if we'll be in april 20 
three or will be in March 25, but we will be within the parameters of that time. So we will be starting to shape what um, our inspection will look like and colleagues across North West London um, are meeting, so we're meeting to do some peer reviewing of our services to make sure that we're doing, um, we're, we're getting to where we need to be for the new inspection framework. It hasn't been published yet, so we, we need to wait until October for it to be published. There's some drafts um, coming out at the moment, and it is exactly what we would expect. One of the, the reasons I'm explaining that is one of the questions that um, Councillor Dennis asked was around the staff survey and certainly staffing, um, and what our staff think of how um, social care is at this moment in time and working for the council. And every year, Social Work England asks all local authorities to join in a, it's a voluntary survey completed by social care staff and it's split into two categories. It's split into a category of qualified staff and unqualified staff, which is not probably the best way of putting it, but we're talking about qualified social workers and frontline care staff and qualified occupational therapists and others related to the profession. And so every year we complete a survey through Social Work England, and we do that voluntary, uh, voluntarily because it gives us a good measure. It's a very comprehensive survey. And we very recently have had that survey returned to us, um, and as with previous year, this year, every area of the survey is reported as good, which is, is a very good measure of our um, social care services. And what that tells me is that caseloads for social workers are not too high. They're measured in the amount of work and pressure that you're putting and, uh, social workers under, so they're not having too much work to do. That people with complex cases have a very measured and manageable um, caseload. That frontline social care staff are able to contact a manager and be able to speak to those managers if they need to and get the support they need. So in terms of how our workforce are doing at the moment, they're doing well because we've been benchmarked across London and nationally and we rate very well in that area. In terms of the staff survey completed by Hillingdon recently, social care, um, adult social care and health staff, um, it was a genuine, a generally positive response. There's areas of um, questions. I wouldn't say concern, but questions. So um, things like flexible working and how that's operated now for social care staff. And that's been a particular... If anything has any good has come out of the pandemic, that's worked particularly well for social workers because... For my services, social workers shouldn't be sitting at a desk in the civic centre. They should be in front of a service user and completing assessments and helping people to get their needs met. So it's actually changed operationally, helped us change the way of working. They were happy with the kit that they were supplied with in terms of IT equipment. These were the sorts of questions we raised with them. Um, their levels of stress were manageable and they accepted that the council provides a good level of um, support for their own mental health and managing that. So some of the challenges coming out of that was definitely about flexible working and about how people can operate throughout their day and those are the things that we'll be picking up within our own directorates and we're not alone in social care but in so where we, we are different is we've got I've got two lots of staff, if you like, where I've got staff in Jan's area that are or in two lots of Jan's area. One are office-based staff and need to be, and one are frontline carers and need to be. So that kind of deals with that. And the other group of staff are those that should be out in the field working with um, residents. So all in all, I think it was a positive outcome to the survey and it gives us good direction. And something like that staff survey with an action plan gives us good feedback and information actually for our inspection, for upcoming inspections. So um, it, it works really well. 
Um, one of the Sorry, other Sandra, can I just interrupt? Because um, cool. I did email Sandra a bunch of questions when I read the report because they're just on top of my head. So thank you, thank you for indulging me by answering the questions. And when Sandra finishes, I won't ask any more questions. I'll <laughs> ask questions. Uh, and apologies if I've asked questions, Sandra, that you were going to ask. Um, but the report was very full and very interesting, which is why so many questions are generated. But just at that point, um, I just wanted to explain why I asked about the staff stuff because ultimately, uh, in this, in your area, that relationship between those who deliver the service and those who receive the service is so, so important. Yeah. And it can be a situation where, you can, you, in the past, certainly, I don't know if it's still the case, there can be quite high turnover and a lot of competition, especially in the London area. So, so, so for me, it's in it's really important that we are looking after our staff in this area and understanding what their needs are. The flexible working thing is a beautiful point in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, you can compete on money or try to, but, but if you can compete on other ways, and I know caseload as well um, in, in, in the um, court parenting stuff I do, I know that was yeah. a massive deal in terms of improving um, our work in the area, was actually giving manageable caseloads to people. So um, I just wanted to let the committee know that's why I thought it was, a, you know, that's why it was one of the first questions I asked having read the report. Yeah. So um, it, it's good to hear that, you know, this is something that you're interested in and uh, A, has positive results, but e, B, is something that you're considering in terms of managing this whole area. Thank you. I think it's, um, you're absolutely right in terms of often we can't compete on money, not because um, we benchmark high uh, um, as an outer London borough in terms of what we're paying. So we pay our providers and our, our own staff, and we make sure that we, we're doing well in that respect. And then you'll get a complete outlier that will, such as Buckinghamshire at the moment, that is way, way, way in excess of what we currently pay because they're trying to recruit staff because they have a huge deficit at this moment in time. So we're never going to compete with that unless we give good lifestyle choices, which is we've been told by staff through the surveys that that's what they want. They want good work-life balance and they want, they want to come to work and enjoy coming to work. They want the environment here to be better and that's something that through the council strategy that will be better. Um, and that's really important to people as well that when they do come in, they've got a good environment to come into. So um, the final part to that is the availability of career progression and training. And as a council, I think we, we have a very good apprenticeship program for social workers and social care staff. We have, um, it was started a number of years ago. I can't take the credit for that. It was before my time, but it is running and it's excellent, um, where we have apprentice social workers notoriously difficult area to recruit staff to social workers and AMPS, approved mental health practitioners and we have a full complement of AMPS, no one in London can say that, but we've grown our own so we've trained them, we've brought staff in, social workers given them the opportunity to become an AMP. all we have to do is retain them now because the market will try and lure people away so it is important that we do have a good offer for our staff. Um, our apprentice social workers go on to do their post qualifying uh, with us and we make sure that they are supported through their post qualifying years and we retain reasonably well as long as we build our in our continuous progression so people can go from a I think there's probably two or three apprentices at the moment that have previously worked in Jan's area as frontline care staff. So we've got good progression through. And I would say this, wouldn't I, because it's my area of work, but those people know residents and their needs really well. So it's, it's, it's a very good programme. Um, th thanks, Sandra. I've, I'm just going to, I'm going to go freestyle. And if it crashes and burns, you can all blame me on this. But as you've got a lot to say, obviously, because it's a very big area, um, and I've asked a bunch of questions by email, and you're going to go through them, which is fantastic for me. But in, in terms of break, breaking up how we do this, I wondered if, if there are specific areas that you're talking about, i.e. at the moment staffing, and people have questions on those areas, put up those hands, so sort of I'll just put up that hand. Is your question related to staffing? So, so, and obviously as we go through, and if, if at the end, after you answer my question, there are other questions as well which aren't related to that, then please go. So, um, so I'm, I'm changing how we're running this meeting, so hopefully it'll work. But, but as you're talking about the staffing point, if anybody has any questions on that point while we're on it, do raise your hand so I see Tony's next as well. So, Sittle, do you want to ask a question? 
Um, hello, Sandra. Hi. Um, I just um, I think you've answered the question because my question when I was reading the report was um, what were the challenges, and I'm assuming that this what you're talking about these are the challenges, and this is what you're doing to um, address those challenges as well. And this is kind of looking at more of a holistic approach in how you can retain staff rather than just train them up for them to go and leave to go to other areas or exactly. anything like that. Because clearly in the rise of your services, as you quite clearly point out, that this is going to kind of get higher and higher, the needs are going to get more, Absolutely. that that retention of staff and the need for um, for, for people are going to, going to be there. So um, do you feel that you are... Um, adequately staffed or do you feel that you are to be able to meet those needs moving forward in this because that was one of the questions that I had about staffing. Sure um, and a really good question I think it, it would it wouldn't be right for me to say that we've got no workforce issues because every social care department in the country has workforce uh, recruitment and retention issues but we are working towards a strategy for changing that. So as part of the North West London um, Directors Group, we are joining our staff together so that they can work together to form um, recruitment strategies from both overseas, from um, locally. We try not to pinch each other's staff where we can help it, so we try to make sure that we're working together as a group so that people are working if we can enhance as Tony described our localities model so I'm sure I'm, I'm telling you something that you probably already know but as GPs now are moving into localities and neighbourhoods we will start to form our services around those and that will enable us to form our staff around those localities provide services to the residents in that area which it, it gives you have the right amount of staffing at the right time so we can identify that in the right place but equally it gives people that are working so they start to know their communities a much more sense of purpose in, in the work that they're doing and that would be both adults and children and our public health and health colleagues so it wraps around the community and that's the intention um, and hopefully that supports staff to be able to work in a way that keeps them in Hillingdon as opposed to anywhere else. Thank you. Tony? Just following on for that a little bit, about the care assessment changes that come in in October. Sure. Um, do you know what numbers you, you're expecting? Because you said the number's going to go up. And, and can, have you got enough staff to cope if it's really high numbers, or will you be recruiting more staff to, to help? So there is there's some grant funding from the government to support the um, the process of us establishing what the pressure will look like. If you listen to, so I think Jan and I have probably attended more webinars than I've ever done in my life recently on this matter, um, and everybody has a view that it's going to be thousands and hundreds and I think the piece of work that we've we've started to do now and Jan's leading on this and she might be able to give a bit more detail but we between now and the 14th of October we're required to understand what our numbers will look like and form a draft plan which goes to Department of Health and Social Care and that plan will establish how many people are likely to come to our front door for support because currently it's the proportion of people um, coming, we already know a lot of those people will be in a care setting so we will already know them some of them will be self-funders that have placed themselves into a care home that we won't necessarily know about for many reasons care homes don't want to tell us that information so we have an exercise to do and um, a piece of grant funding to, to carry out that market research with the providers and we'll know by the end of October what that looks like. By February we then have a plan as to how we enact what happens next and what staffing requirements that will be. In the first instance, because in October people will start their clock ticking, we'll start to do some assessments earlier than that if we can. So if we're up and ready and running, 
by the middle of um, spring next year, we'll do our assessments early. They won't get the care cap any earlier, but we will have done the work in advance. So rather than have a pressure that then might make other people that, I'm not saying people coming to us won't be in need, because of course they are, because they're in receipt of services, but any urgent need. So we'll, we'll try and smooth the pressure out as we go along. So in short, in answer to your question, we don't know yet, yet but we are working on it, we will. Um, we're slightly ahead of most other London boroughs in what we're in, in our information gathering. Is that correct, Jan? Yeah. Yeah, we then started on the Sorry, Jan, can you move that microphone around here? Thanks. So we started on the fair cost of care exercise where we're engaging with all of our providers, so that's the care homes and our domiciliary care providers with the criteria that the care homes that are taking part in the exercise are 65 and over, and the domiciliary care providers that provide personal care to people aged 18 and over. And so far, we've had some really good engagement with our providers, and we're at 35% return from across our providers. And in, in Hillingdon, we have 33 care homes that will be eligible for this, and 39 domiciliary care providers. A lot of them are saying that they will participate and undertake the review and provide the information and they are looking to do that by the end of this month so we've got time to analyse and provide the first draft of the plan um, to publish to the De Department of Health and Social Care. So there is, there is some good return and it will also give us the intelligence with the homes that are going to be providing this and domiciliary care about the self-funding market as well. So we will probably have a lot more better information than we've probably had in a long time on that. Okay, thanks, Tony. And when you have that draft, would it be possible to share with us and maybe come and speak to us about that? Yes. Because that's something that I think that would interest us a lot. Thank you. Um, Philip. Um, sorry, Jen. We are, we are mainly, we are, no, I, ideally just on staffing, but obviously these things. Uh, just, just a quick one. It's just whether we're um, still doing our wonderfully innovative partnership work with the Bruno University uh, because they, they've helped us a lot over the years uh, with finding new talent and helping us uh, develop people. Is, is that still happening at the moment? Absolutely. I'm, I have to just check with Jan in terms of frontline care and Box because obviously, so we, Box University give us students, nursing students, and we also have some MBA students on apprenticeships from the council at the moment with box as well. But the nursing students actually are from Hillington Hospital and are placed within our care homes within the borough and um, give us a source of income because we're, we're funded to take those placements and we support those. And the really positive thing is when you go into the hospital, which uh, I don't do very often these days, but when you walk into A&E and see one of our residents there and you see a nurse that's been in one of our services, they're working with them, you know that they've had that training and that support. So, yeah, we've got really good support and we're working a lot with Brunel now in terms of practice improvement, monitoring of social care, uh, social work um, practice and um, starting to develop our principal social worker principles with them. Jean. Thank you, Chairman. Glad to hear, Sandra, that you're working with, uh, with the, um, the university in regards to bringing the students in. As you know, straight across the whole system, there's a, short, a shortage of staff and there's also agency staff, which is a lot of cost. How much of those agency staff is around? Because in the care sector, staffing level is very poor at the moment. And you're giving us a picture that this is the work that you're doing. But obviously, there's that big gap in the middle of it that yes. is not able to provide that service. So how much of that agency, the agency work, is it's outsourcing, which will impact on the cost that you're trying to build your whole care plan around. Absolutely. Um, having agency staff is, is, can sometimes be a blessing, but in, in the main it's quite a challenge, and it's something that we would want to eradica eradicate where we can, and hence our Grow Your Own Social Workers in that, in that field. In Jan's um, service area where it's direct care, so frontline care workers, where there has been a lot of media coverage about um, the lack of frontline care services 
being available to people so they can't leave hospital, um, yes, it's a challenge and much of that is around making sure that we as a local authority, um, if we're contracting um, for the care, that we're paying the agencies the right money to uh, ensure that the person gets paid the right wage in their pocket rather than what the council is paying to the agency. So that's important in our contracting. Um, we do use set agencies. So, you know, we do have some really good, I mean, I think Jan can probably talk about in her area where we have um, what we, we call a contingent labour model. So we have a set group of staffing, but of course those staff go on leave or have sickness and have holidays, and etc. So we have a pool of agency staff known to residents, known to the staff they're working with, so that it doesn't put so much pressure on the system. Financially, it's not the best option for us to be doing. The contingent labour model certainly is, because you're only covering when you need to, so you don't always replicate every shift if you don't need to. But um, agency staff in a social work post, for example, we would prefer to recruit, and recruiting isn't easy at this moment in time, which is why we're looking at the whole range of options that we can have to try and bring people into the sector. Thank, thank you. Feel free to move on from staffing to your, your next section. <laughs> but thank you, that's all been very interesting. So, and just to reiterate, ideally, I'd like questions on the sections that, that Sandra goes through, and then at the end, there'll be other questions that don't come up, then please ask the question. Um, obviously, happy to go with the flow as well. I think just while we're talking about frontline care staff, and we have been, it would be a good opportunity just to talk about one of your questions around contract monitoring and quality of care providers in the borough, which is... Um, much more Jan's area, but um, and she will talk about that in a second. But um, just for for reassurance for the committee and um, actually for mine as the director of social care, is that we have some very stringent um, quality monitoring standards, and we have a quality monitoring team based within um, adult social care who monitor all registered care provision across the borough. So it doesn't matter whether we contract with them or not, we've got a duty to ensure that they're providing in line with regulation. And the team monitor all of those um, services. CQC monitor everything regulated and we will audit for the purposes of best value for residents if there are any safeguarding matters and making sure that what residents are effectively buying, whether they pay for it or not, but what residents are effectively buying in their care package is good value and it meets their needs, and that's how the team are managed. In terms of contracting, we monitor all of the contracts, including in-house services provided by the council, um, at a monthly provider risk panel. So we look at all of the providers care homes, domiciliary and outreach providers and make sure that they um, are doing what they need to be doing, that they're financially sound and viable and that residents are getting their needs met. And if they're not, then they are risk rated and we monitor them in a different way. So much more scrutiny we liaise with our colleagues in CQC and, monitor, and they will inspect. Um, if from the provider risk panel monthly, a, um, a list of providers with recommendations is brought to the Care Governance Board, which I chair, and Jan will present all of the findings of the month or the, the, care, the quality team have monitored and any safeguarding matters that have come to our attention, any complaints, any members' inquiries, and it's all brought together and we then ensure that we make a decision about whether we actually continue to use that provider. So it's a corrective, not punitive process to try and maintain uh, residents in their placement because moving is disruptive. So we try to ensure that we're giving um, the provider the support to improve. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. And in the main, I would say 90% of the time, at least 90% of the time, provider will improve because of course it's their business and they need to 
um, and we give them an awful lot of support to make sure that they do. Um, is there anything that you want to add with that, Dan? Um, I think we also work with our neighbouring local authorities, so as North West London we come together as a quality forum to also share intelligence because we all use similar providers, big organisations and providers, and that also helps us gather the information to make informed decisions. And we would inform neighbouring local authorities if, if they have people placed or if they are thinking of commissioning them so they can make informed decisions and it works vice versa as well for us. So we're, we're sharing that quality information. Um, the quality monitoring team also work, work very closely with HHCP and the Care Home Support Service um, and we've built up a really good working relationship, especially again that's another positive from the pandemic how much we had to escalate the support that we gave to the care homes. But again, we're sharing information, we're supporting them and directing and signposting care home managers and domiciliary care providers to resources and training to improve on the quality of provision. So as as it's, it's more of a supportive measure than a punitive measure because we want good quality providers within Hillingdon. Thank you. I do, I do like the corrective supportive approach and obviously still with the courage to, to cut when cutting is necessary, but, but ultimately um, you know, that, that is the most positive approach where possible. Does anybody have any questions on this aspect? Tony, yeah. Sorry, it's a bit of an obvious question, I think. Um, difference between regulated and, reg and unregulated? I, I understand, I think I understand regulated, but what, what, what would be an unregulated? So unregulated care, in the main, will be housing-related support. So somebody with a mental health need, for example, that is struggling to live completely independently and may need some direction, somebody going into them once a week to say, have you paid your bills, have you got some shopping in the fridge, that kind of, and that would be unregulated care. Anything over and above that, i.e. take your tablets um, and sorting the medication out for them would be regulated. June. No, we're, no. So what? 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 No, no. So what we're doing is I emailed Sandra yesterday a bunch of questions just because my head was going crazy in the heat. So, so, and Sandra's kindly dealing with them in a thematic sort of way. So what we're going to do is on the specific areas. Uh, pick up those questions. Then at the end, if there's something that I've not asked a question about, then there'll be a free-for-all. So questions on other things that you have, June. Um, so, but the questions I asked were mainly about things that weren't in the report, actually, um, sort of some of the details behind them, such as staffing and, uh, and monitoring and also funding. Am I segueing nicely? You are. Fund? Fantastic. <laughs> um, the question in relation to social care funding is, a challenging one at this moment in time, as you can imagine. It, it, I mean, it, it doesn't matter how much um, government would give us in terms of funding, it will always be a challenge. It's always going to be difficult to manage. So our priority is making sure that we have, as we talked earlier, an excellent front door and that people are eligible and that people have the right early intervention. So um, in terms of figures, I can get those to the committees because off the top of my head I can't tell you what those are. But what I would say is um, the priority for the council is to ensure that residents get their needs met to make them as independent as possible. It's as basic as that because if we start with that ethos and somebody has a life event which could be a fall and break a hip or could be an, an illness or become unwell and have a need for some social care support. What is, what is a traditional model has always been is that they get some home care. And what we want people to do is to come out of hospital or not go into hospital in the first place and for us to intervene very early, support people and give them as much support the, that they need in an inter intermediate care way to prevent them from deteriorating further and being able to return to what we would call as their baseline. And everyone would say, well, that makes perfect sense. But that is the only way of managing a social care budget as well. So it's the right thing to do. 
it's good for residents and it manages the budget and you would think that that would be that's the standard thing but it is something that we have to try very hard at to make that work so we have to change the mindsets of uh, residents who and particularly of families who want care wrapped around people so the use of assistive technology is so important to try and gain we re and regain independence for residents so that they can be well supported and do as much for themselves almost everybody wants that for themselves anyway um, and uh, we need to manage the amount of people again it's it, it's interesting the how the pandemic was so difficult but has changed behaviors in some positive ways um, people in care homes we weren't placing people where we could into care homes people stayed at home and had good care and people did well at home and so our model needs to be very much pushing for people to stay at home and get their care in that way we know that people thrive in that environment in a much more positive way so those are the ways that social care needs to manage their budgets going forward and to make sure that um, the charging reforms are applied effectively so that people get the right level of care at the right time, the eligibility in their Care Act assessment is completed and it, it meets people's needs at the earliest possible time. Um, and that will be, for the future, the best way of managing those social care budgets. Sandra, in terms of when you give us this, the future information on funding, in, in very broad terms, I think what would interest us is, you know, where it's spent, obviously, and, and when we have external providers, how much we give to those, as much as you can tell us about that, and also yeah. what we expect from them. So that's sort of, in terms of understanding the landscape, how much do we spend, where do we spend it on, for sure. what reason, uh, and, and then if there are external providers, which of course they are, we give money to, why do we give money to those external providers? Just to, So in, in, in an ideal world, that's sort of how I'd like it set out. If okay. possible, but obviously without overstressing your team and making you do stuff, taking away I from mean, your normal jobs as well. Absolutely, no, that that's not a problem. And we we break our um, budgets down into primary support need for learning disability, mental health, uh, public health, um, older people, etc. So it's you'll be able to see what the spend is. Without looking, I can tell you that the spend on placement of care is the highest budget so in terms of care homes and high and complex learning disability budget is the highest of all of those um, and always will be and if you um, can imagine that people going into care quite often will go into perhaps high level supported living rather than residential care now with a learning disability they will be going at 18 so and they have lifelong care needs so that will always be the highest demand on social care budget. Does anybody have any questions on funding particularly? Or are we good? Oh, Philip. Just a quick one on this um, fair cost of care exercise. So we've heard about the process. We've got a, there's a piece of work to be done that we presented to the Department of Health. What assumptions are we able to make, if at all, about the impact on the MTFF moving forward? in future years or is that, is that a big question we still need to know the answer to it can, can you just say what NTFF is just for those I who beg your pardon okay. medium term financial forecast I beg your pardon um, we're not quite there in the assumptions yet um, we will get an average of what the fair cost of care impact will be it will impact care providers and it will impact um, social care so we will have a, a differential between what we currently pay and what the average is I don't know whether that, where that will sit in Hillingdon because without going into too much detail what we how we currently buy a care package is through an e-brokerage system where we um, we will have amalgamated bandings for the cost of care as per the needs of the individuals and in the settings that they have so it's still quite a complex piece of work we will have that draft by October and as soon as we have that draft then we'll give you some um, we have a grant
for the first year to go against that. I think fingers and toes will need to be crossed so that meets that, that gap, but I don't think it's quite there yet for us to know that. Great. Yeah. You're welcome to move on. If you, I've forgotten how many questions I asked. To be honest, but you're welcome to move I on. Gonna, I wasn't intending to go through them all. So, no, 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 no. is it? I okay? certainly don't have to. If you stop when you want to stop, and we'll allow others to ask questions. Shall I just um, cover public health? Yeah, I know. Actually, I think Philip mentioned to me earlier that he was interested in asking a question on public health. So, which was similar to, I think, similar to the sort of question I asked. So, Philip, would you like to I'm ask your question on public health? Very happily. Of course, I, I go back to the days when uh, we actually took public health over uh, from health back in 2013, I think it was, under the CARE Act. And um, for many, many, many years, we inherited contracts that came from health, and they were driven by health. And I always think of health services be, being very provider-orientated, and I think in local government we have an opportunity to create services that are much more in our image, much more modern, much more customer-friendly. And I note that we are will be tendering for some of these services yes. too. And you just wonder what sort of opportunities you see presenting themselves in terms of how these services might look different in the future. Uh, I know with sexual health services, and pe people want to access those in different ways nowadays, in more modern ways. Yep. Uh, what, sort, what sort of opportunities do you see uh, as part of that piece of work? I think we've got a huge opportunity now. Um, because of the localities model, and as Tony talked about the family hubs model that we're looking at, um, looking to deliver services differently to residents. So rather than everyone comes to the civic centre or everyone goes to a place, um, having services locally that people can go into, but equally joining up with our health colleagues in primary care and ensuring that we, we jointly service residents. So public health contracts that we are looking at at this moment in time are, um, as you say, the sexual health, drug and alcohol um, contracts. They are kind of the kind of leading contracts that are within this. Equally, we have things like school nursing, um, district nursing, there's so many. <laughs> um, Gosh, what other public health contracts do we have? Midwifery. All of those types of services are provided um, through the public health contract, and they're provided locally in children's centres currently. And things like the anti-obesity strategy, smoking cessation, um, a whole range of services that we need to review. They've been in place for approximately five to seven years now and we want to give them a really good review and work out where they're best placed, whether they actually sit within you know, one delivery point or whether we need to separate them out and we will do a market warming and um, testing exercise later in the year to see what the interest is and what the innovation can be and we've shared that information with the current provider, so uh, we're able to talk to them about how, how we'll go forward on that. Um, it will be a really positive um, review. We've got some excellent services currently, but we want to see what we can do more of to get um, better population health management. Uh, I'm giving more work to ourselves, but again, when that review is concluded and the marking testing has been done, I think we'd be really interested to find out as a committee what you've learnt and, and, and what direction you're going forward. So um, if, if that would be possible to come to this committee when, when you're at a good state, obviously speak to Nikki about when that might be. And actually, our, our new Director of Public Health is absolutely fabulous, of course, and um, really is able to give a very good... Um, look at our, a forward plan for public health and how we take forward all of these contracts and how we, um, we make some differences because we're looking for generational change in our new models of working and ensuring that children right the way through, you know, from pre-birth to um, those in gen services that are over 100, um, all get the same opportunities and get better life chances. Ultimately, 
that re reduces demands on services going forward. So it's really important that we get all of these contracts right. Thank you. Sitel. Just, sorry, just on that public health um, agenda, I, I just wanted to ask, will there, in that review, will there be the opportunity, um, we've talked about procurement and looking at contracts and how contracts are given um, to providers, will there be an opportunity to kind of mix local with big, like smaller with bigger providers as well, because there's an always this opportunity of like groundwork people who, you know, they may not have yeah. the resources of the big companies, but the big companies then take over absolutely everything. And, you know, and, and that marriage of the two, um, is that something that is going to be in, uh, fundamental or integral to that kind of review and that yeah. approach moving forward? I mean, I, I think that's a really good point, and I think it's something that we need to understand from market suppliers going forward. Not all of the contracts that, as they exist at the moment are with one supplier, so team. So they do get specialist services and support, and they do have skilled services. They don't have a specifically identified team at the moment. Whether we will do that in the future? Um, I think it really will depend on the demand and how we manage that going forward and what the specialism needs to be in that area. Um, as I say, currently it sits best with learning disability. Not everybody, I accept, in that team has a learning disability. They may have learning difficulties um, and, and they come through as adults. It's an effective way of supporting those individuals because if someone's behaviour is... Um, challenging, the cost of a care placement escalates significantly and that doesn't matter whether it's somebody with a learning disability, autism, mental health or dementia, the cost of the placement goes up significantly and so the positive behaviour support team um, work with individuals and provide a support plan to uh, and these specialist techniques to uh, redirect people's behaviours and help them be without um, needing to display behaviours. And so it's a, actually they're, they're an excellent team. Great. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Is yeah. it generally now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Freestyle. Fine, fine. I'm not sure if we're doing your system. Sandra, or can, or if Sandra Jan can or cannot answer depending on what they want. Okay, so okay. Uh, well, you indulged me already, so I'll, no, no, I'll just, good just, 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 a, just a couple of things, really. I mean, can I say that obviously I was Cabinet member for what, I think 16 years pretty much, and uh, I have enormous faith in the officer team. I would say that, wouldn't I? But. Um, You've, you've given us a great report this evening. Uh, there's some great stuff going on. This is a momentous time. There's all kinds of change happening, but it was ever thus, wasn't it, Sandra? It and, uh, was always Jan, going to uh, be. If, if you think about it. That said, um, I'm conscious that um, within the report um, on the performance bit, it, we're saying there's none at this stage. And I'm just wondering whether, uh, are there no current performance indicators on any aspects of these service? Because I know that the, uh, I think um, Councillor Mills uh, select committee prior to elections uh, agreed a, a format a regime of reporting uh, on, per on performance across the service and I'm just wondering how it fits in so I suppose it's a broader question than just what we've been hearing about but although we're capable of course of looking beyond performance figures it doesn't give us a whole story it is useful for context and it'd be just interesting right. to know if there is anything available in these areas more generally and how it's going to work moving forward. And then just one, one question, if I can, just, just one final question, Philip, if I may. Philip, Philip, shall I let Sandra answer that, then you can come sure. back with your yes. question. So, and, and just added to Philip, Philip's question, Matt, when do you reckon we can get some good yeah. data? Okay, so there is performance data yeah. um, for all of the services. The pulling of that together into a dashboard that you would probably want to see rather yeah. than what I can interpret it from um, because it is an amalgamated um, service now since 1st of May. Um, it, it's coming and I can provide you with some performance data individually per service but now we, we are having a, uh, a dashboard as Councillor Mills rightly said he yeah. wants to see a way of um, monitoring performance and ensuring that we're making a difference um, and so yes I, w I will make sure that that is supplied to you as soon as we have it available. Okay and, and in 
obviously we want it as soon as possible but also we want it in the way that you feel Precisely. best as well so don't just feel like oh next week you get it oh, you get part b and send it to yeah. us you know if, it, if it's better that you put it all together for example in two months time for example sure. um but obviously I'll, I'll let you judge that i will uh, find out where the dashboard yeah. is up to yeah. great uh, Philip, yeah, and, and it might be that there are some areas with, with no performance indicators. It may be a question of some benchmarking or something like that. But yeah. ha how have you judged it best yeah. professionally to present? That would be helpful. My, my final question, I promise it is, and that's really around um, uh, the uh, discharge to assess, because that's something else that uh, I was involved in. Yeah. And uh, I can see that that's clearly come on. Um, I understand that Comfort Care have a role in that here, and I think they're based at the Civic Centre, if I'm oh, not mistaken. Yeah. Um, I just wondered how that's progressing sort of what, two or three years in now in terms of its impact on delayed discharges from hospital. Um, I was um, advised very recently because there's been a review of um, because government funding has now changed from pandemic funding so back to old processes um, but we, we've taken we took the decision before the pandemic to use discharge to assess as a model for people coming out of hospital and we're continuing to do so. So we operate that model um, straight from hospital to discharge to assess which means people go straight home from hospital um, and a care service goes straight into those individuals within two hours of them arriving at home to make sure that they get their needs met pending a social work review rather than going into a hospital seeing someone in a bed you honestly don't get any p picture of somebody sitting in a hospital bed who can't make a decision about what type of care they want sitting in a hospital bed so it's a very positive step for them to go into their own home obviously you have to be fit enough for that to happen but they go into their own home they have their assessment they stay approximately five days with that service and in that time, a decision about where their care need is best met is made with them and their families. And we have approximately ooh, 460 hours a week of, of care going in. So if you can imagine, that's probably about seven hours a week per individual. Um, so it's quite a lot of people per week going through that service. Um, the aim is that they go straight from discharge to assess into reablement, which is also provided by Comfort Care. So we've got a pathway from hospital into quick assessment, determine where their needs are best met, and then into a form of reablement, so rehab um, at home uh, with a physio and with an OT also supporting the carers. And our discharge model has been said to be the most mature in North West London and is currently being looked at as the model to be replicated and standardised across um, hospitals across um, and social care departments across North West London because it is effective and it has been for some time now. It's always good to hear when we're doing stuff that others want to copy. Great. Are there any other questions? Junior, it's free, free, yeah, free freestyle. So, on uh, Sandra, on page 21, the last paragraph, you got approved mental health profession, and a hub provide, uh, there's a hub that provides a 24/7 service. How is this delivered to users, and by whom? And is it across the borough, or is it shared with Northwest London? No, it's um, Hillington Zone. So this is our group of approved mental health practitioners. So they are social workers and they predominantly um, support people through the night. So there is a team of 30, but we are, it's 24-7 and they support people through the night to um, if they need a Mental Health Act assessment. And so they will often be at the hospital at the place of safety bed in the section 136 suite so they will attend with the police they will meet with the doctors and they will attend A&E and they support individuals 
24 hours a day. So. So um, Sorry, we had a delivery of that at our last meeting and yes. that was mentioned that so that's part of it. So yes. thank you. Great. Okay. So if we're happy, um thank you so much Sandra and Jan for coming to speak to us. Really interesting, a massive wide area that we're getting our heads around but really useful and I think we'll be seeing quite a bit of you over the next year anyway. <laughs> so it's more of an oracle. Okay. Chairman, I'm minded that um, in October we've got um, CAMs scheduled. Oh, yes, we do. Well, CAMs, definitely. and that might be quite a large okay. and long Fair item. Enough. So I'm kind of minded Fair enough. that, I mean, if the, Care Act, if the Care Act information does come forward in October, yeah. although it's quite early October, our meeting, then potentially having it there, I mean, we could probably yeah. get away with that. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, actually having both the Care Act and the procurement stuff yeah. to the meeting in November. Because okay. the November meeting is you're, much you're, lighter. You're right, and I think that's a great idea because CAMs will be a big issue, definitely. That we want to get into. Yeah. And right. Chairman, the um, safeguarding board, adult safeguarding board um, reports likely to come in October as well. Okay, brilliant. So if we do the procurement one and the Care Act one in November, and then do those in October, that seems to work pretty well. Um, from what Sandra was saying, January seems would possibly be a good meeting for the public health stuff. Yep. So obviously for you to check. Uh, and also, I was thinking that inviting the cabinet member in April to come, because we discussed it, we thought it was a good idea, we said maybe March or April, but I think ideally April's probably better looking at the, the work programme. But in terms of, and obviously, if, if, if the cabinet member can't do April, then she can do March, we'll do March instead. I think um, April might be quite useful. Like you say, it'll be, it'll be down to the availability of the cabinet member, but April might be a good time for her to come along because it will be towards the end of the year, as in the end of the municipal year, and it will be after the end of the financial year, so it might actually be quite useful for her to come then. Perfect time to ask what you've done, what you're going to do. <laughs> Hopefully, but we'll find out. Excellent. So those are my views on sort of the evolution of our work programme. Does anybody have any other views on the work programme? No? Excellent. Okay. Is that it then? Okay, excellent. <laughs> I'll draw this meeting to a close. Thank you everybody for coming along and see you in September. <laughs>